So here's my next survey question. How many of you started the day with breakfast? Pretty good, almost everybody, right? Maybe a couple of breakfast skippers. Well, we start the day with breakfast because we all know that breakfast is the most important meal of the day, right? That's how we get started. So, next question. How many of you got in your 10,000 steps today? A few, a few, I know, so we got started kind of early. How many of you try to get in 10,000 steps? That's really good. How many of you know about 10,000 steps? <laughs> yeah, we all do. Right? Just like breakfast, the most important meal of the day, 10,000 steps. That's how we stay healthy. It's a nice, easy way to do it. Right? It's good for our heart. It's, we can lose weight. It actually improves our brain function. All that kind of stuff. So um, both of those things are just part of our cultural shorthand about health. Things like you're supposed to drink eight glasses of water a day and get eight, eight hours of sleep a day. Do you ever wonder where these came from? I did. So the breakfast thing, this may come as a shock, but the breakfast, most important meal of the day, you know who started that? Breakfast cereal manufacturers. Yeah. No kidding. 1944, an ad campaign for Great Nuts. And the campaign, the marketers called it, eat a good breakfast, do a better job. And they promoted that, and then there were radio ads, 1944 radio, that said, nutrition experts say breakfast, breakfast is the most important meal of the day. And now we all believe it. What about the, uh, oh, by the way, uh, when I was looking this stuff up, and I found some information about it, you ever hear of Dr. John Kellogg? Yep. Kellogg, right, Kellogg's Corn Flakes, Kellogg's of uh, Battle Creek. Well, he had a number of interesting ideas and inventions and views, uh, not the least of which is that Corn Flakes not only would make you healthier, but would help reduce your unhealthy desire for sex. <laughs> it's true, you can look that up. So now I'm looking at you guys, and I'm looking, how many of you just made a mental note to never get near a cornflake again? <laughs> I, know, I know this crap. Okay, so um, how about 10,000 steps? You know where that came from? So uh, there was a professor at epidemiology at the Harvard School of Public Health who wrote a, a this only came out about a year or two ago, so it's pretty recent, had a, uh, a study in the Journal of the American Medical Association. She started looking into the 10,000 step rule because uh, she was curious about where it came from. And it turns out that the original basis for 10,000 steps was, wait for it, a marketing strategy. And it came from, uh, in 1965, a Japanese company was selling pedometers. Hmm. And they gave it a name in Jap that in Japanese means the 10,000 step meter. And they actually think that uh, they came up with 10,000 steps because the character, the Japanese character for 10,000 steps sort of looks like a man walking. Hmm. So that's where it comes from. And uh, as far as the professor knows, the actual health merits of that number have never been validated by any real medical research. So after I'd read about this stuff, about the origins of breakfast and 10,000 steps, and I started wondering about the origins of other cultural conventions that we just accept without question. Um, and one of them is this statement, which I am confident that every single person in this room believes in without question, and we talk about it all the time, and that is the American dream of home ownership. Okay? Uh, you ever wonder where that came from? Well, I did. And uh, as you know, maybe the first timers will begin to learn, uh, I'm a history geek, and so I started doing a little bit of research, and then I realized, so I'm actually doing a lot of work at NAR on this presidential advisory group, and I have uh, built some relationships with some of the NAR research, research staff, and they'll do research for it. If you don't know that, NAR has the largest real estate library in the world, and you call them up and they'll look stuff up for you. So I asked them, where did the American dream of home ownership come from? And they said, that's a good question, Steve. Nobody's ever asked. So they looked it up. And uh, here's what I have found out. And so with thanks to Hathaway Hester and Frederick Keller, two of uh, NER's amazing research staff, here's what we know. We can identify with precision the origin of the term the American dream. In 1931, historian James T. Adams included it in a book called The Epic of America. And here's how he defined it. Quote, that dream of a land in which life should be better, 
and richer and fuller for everyone with opportunity for each according to ability or achievement, close quote. Now that can mean a lot of things. You can read into that a lot. And remember this is 1931, this is the heart of the depression. That message resonated. The American dream, you can get out of this if you work hard, if you have the ability to do it, if you work hard. So in the 1930s, the American dream found its way into speeches, plays, articles, people read into it things like that it was about financial success, that it was about neighborly cooperation, idealism, equality, individualism. But what about um, home ownership? Where did that come from? Well, it might come as a surprise, maybe not, it came from us, the realtors. First people to talk about the American dream of home ownership. And we did not discuss that concept on all through the 30s, 40s, maybe a few times in the 50s and 70s, we really started talking about the American dream of home ownership in 1984. And uh, it was part of a campaign when NAR was promoting uh, Private Property Week, which is the precursor to American Home Ownership Month. And there was a TV show that NAR sponsored in 1984 called Home Sweet Home, Still the American Dream. That's what, like 50 years ago? And even then, the question was, is this still the American dream? We talk about that all the time. Is it still the American dream? Are we losing it? Right? So this isn't new. So uh, for those of you who have been around, oh, and by the way, that has become such a part of who we are that when NER celebrated its 100th anniversary, the book, the picture book that they took, put together is 100 years in celebration of the American dream. Right, that's what we talk about, that's who we are. And there's a picture up on the screen. So now this may be the point where you kind of say, well, this is all interesting stuff, <coughs> it happens every year. Uh, really enjoy this, but what's your point? <laughs> right? Where are you going with all of this? And um, where we're going is that not everyone has had an equal and fair shot at the American dream over the course of our history. And um, I hesitate because I wasn't sure whether I was gonna actually uh, uh, use this, but yeah, as game data <coughs> so um, you know, when we talk about the American dream, a big part of that is that every generation will have a better life than their parents, right? That's part of what we like to think about. And I kind of think about like my own story, we all have our story, and we all have our kind of personal mythology about ourselves and how we ended up, how we got here, how we got to the room today that we're in. Uh, so um, for me, I'll tell you, so I was born in the Bronx, and uh, when I was nine months old, I was put in foster care. And I grew up in Queens, Queens, New York. And uh, my neighborhood was, <laughs> you might call it kind of a hard scrabble neighborhood. Uh, almost all our dads were World War II vets. Like everybody, you know, it seemed like half the dads were cops and firefighters. We used to call them garbage men, right? Sanitation workers. Everybody was in a union. It was that kind of neighborhood. That's that's where I grew up. And I don't want to mislead you. It wasn't like super dangerous, with bullets flying all around. But it was the kind of place where it was really easy to make bad choices and really easy to hang out with the wrong people and end up in prison or dead. And I knew a lot of those guys. I played ball with them. I drank beer with them, right? So was that, you know, that's kind of the background. And uh, with that, I got, you know, pretty lucky and I ended up going to Princeton. And it uh, didn't last very long because I'm not really an Ivy League kind of guy. So um, lasted a couple of years at Princeton, went out to uh, California, worked at a warehouse for a couple of years, and it's time to go back to college. Went to UCLA, worked really hard, graduated Phi Beta Kappa, summa cum laude, went to law school, ended up graduating the top 10% of my class, Worked for a federal judge. I was a law clerk for a very distinguished federal judge who's now on the Ninth Circuit. And, uh, you know, eventually I'm here with you and have a, had a wonderful career working with you. So am I proud of that? Heck yeah, I just spent about two or three minutes bragging about it. <laughs> yeah. And it's real easy for me to say that I, that's all on me. I did it. I worked hard. But here's, you know, here's the reality. Being honest with myself, 
come on, man. I got a lot of breaks. And a lot of doors opened up for me. Because I'm standing here, I am a straight, white, Christian male. And so a lot, you know, doors opened up for me that might not have opened for other people. And I took advantage of them, that's great. And my kids, their life is going to be better than mine, because they're amazing. It's all, it's the American dream. But, and here's really the point, for so many of our fellow Americans, the doors didn't open up. The doors were slammed in their face. And not only that, you know, the door, they didn't even get to see the house. But heck, they weren't even allowed, literally, weren't even allowed in the neighborhood, all right? That's the history. When we talk about history, that's, that's the history. So I do want to share a little bit of this, that um, for most of our history, individuals and groups, especially African Americans, uh, were systematically and intentionally excluded from or deterred from equal access to home ownership. It's fact. And this wasn't based just on individual choices and prejudices. This was in large part based on uh, intentional, deliberate and repeated government policies. Fact. So there is a, a, a book, we get the next slide. Uh, if you want to know more about this, this book is amazing, a book called The Color of Law that just traces the entire history of uh, racial segregation in housing in America. And after I read this book, I actually, you know, I went online trying to find, you know, critiques of this book that would, you know, say the methodology is off, or his conclusions are crazy, couldn't find it. So it's, pre it's pretty solid stuff. Makes a very compelling case. So here's uh, just a couple of quick examples. So everybody heard of Levittown? So Levittown was on Long Island, and it was uh, you know, the first real big development for returning GIs uh, after the war. The idea was to you know, have low interest, low cost uh, housing that the GIs could afford. Well, for Levitt, there actually is a Levitt for Levittown. For Levitt, the developer, to get the low interest loans backed by the federal government that he needed, the federal government said, well, you know, we need to protect the value of the collateral so you only can sell to white people. And then the lenders, same thing. When the GIs are coming in to get their mortgages, right, the lenders want to protect the value of their, of their collateral and they require restrictive covenants in the deeds. Where all these restrictive covenants are coming from. It's not the individuals who wanted it. It's the government and you know the, the lending community. It's, it's just it was all part of the system that was stacked against African Americans at the time. So not only, not only, I mean I mentioned before, like you know, all the dads in my neighborhood like were World War II vets. My dad flew in B-17s. He was a, a ball turret gunner in B-17s. You know, I knew a lot of these vets. But not only were the black veterans who put their lives on the line with my dad not allowed to live with them, but think about the generational impacts of that. So these GIs are getting those houses for like 30,000 bucks. And you guys know how this works, right? And the appreciation and that gets passed on and they move on and the generational accumula accumulation of wealth is what propelled those guys, for the most part, into the middle class. But African Americans were denied that. So another example that really um, uh, just opened my eyes when, when I read about stuff like this is um, our own code of ethics. Realtors were part of this. Right? Our code of ethics, and, and I think that it'll be on the next slide, uh, back in the, this I think is from the 1920s, this is in the book, there's an excerpt from it, that uh, prohibited selling to buyers who wouldn't fit in with the neighborhood, and the key words to, that you see here is that a realtor should never introduce into a neighborhood members of any race or nationality whose presence will clearly be detrimental to property values in that neighborhood. Uh, realtors contributed in other ways. And hey, hey guys, when I'm up here, I'm not up here like scolding you and that kind of stuff. <laughs> let, let me jump right to the point here. I, I am a believer in history. And we cannot know where we are now, and we cannot create a vision for the future and where we want to go if we don't understand where we've been. All right, that's my point. <laughs> so another example that's used in the book is look at Palo Alto, California. Palo Alto, Silicon Valley, Stanford. 
I mean, it's one of the most expensive and exclusive and Tony, uh, you know, zip codes in the country. You ever been down there? Yes. You ever go over to East Palo Alto? East Palo Alto is a lot different than Palo Alto. I mean, I'm talking about like, my kids go there, right? So I know this. Blocks, blocks from the university, not far. East Palo Alto, completely different. Here's what happened in 1954, right? A single white homeowner in an all white neighborhood of Palo, East Palo Alto uh, sold their house to uh, African American. Instantly, the president of what eventually became the California Association of Realtors, along with other realtors, started running ads warning of an imminent invasion of uh, African Americans, which of course panicked all the white folks. They sold their houses at discounted panic values to the realtors or the speculators, and then turned around and flipped those homes to desperate Ar African Americans who were looking for housing because they couldn't find housing because they were getting forced out of the Bay Area where many African Americans had gone during the war to work in the shipping industry. Now where am I gonna go? So uh, they're desperate. So they're paying overpriced houses. Many families were doubling up, maybe even tripling. So conditions are deteriorating. And here's another government uh, uh, policy, zoning. So zoning, through zoning, all undesirable activities that you don't want to have in these nice residential neighborhoods, single family residential neighborhoods, they piled them into uh, neighborhoods that were zoned where uh, African Americans were, just a fact, right? So um, today, to this day, when you can drive there 50 years later, no, 70 years later, you can still see the difference between Palo Alto and East Palo Alto. So, um, of course, NAR, you may know, opposed the Fair Housing Act when it was first introduced. So, you know, our history is, is not that great. And even bringing us to the present, I think we're all aware of the investigation that was done on Long Island by Newsday uh, newspaper uh, and the results showing, you know, demonstrating just widespread, pretty significant, some might say appalling violations uh, or alleged violations of the uh, Fair Housing Act by realtors on Long Island. So that's kind of where we are. And again, I, I really want to stress, and I'm, I hope I'm not coming across as like lecturing and, and scolding. It's just, you know, th this is, we are still living with the legacy of mistrust of our organization by, you know, stakeholders in our industry. We got to do something. So we now, though, do have a chance to move forward, to move our organization forward um, with pride, and with purpose. So let's start talking about the good news. <laughs> so when the Newsday story broke, uh, the, literally the very next day, our staff and our leadership, Dale Chumley, Kitty Wallace, Tom Hormel, Rich Bergdahl, our staff, eventually our entire executive committee, uh, we looked at this and said, this is something that we need to do something about in a big way, significant a significant way. This isn't going to be something where we're going to say we're Washington, we're different, we're not, long, we're not Long Island, we don't have those problems here, and if we do it's only a few bad apples. Absolutely not. We are going to reaffirm our commitment and become leaders, national leaders, in our commitment to the principles of the Fair Housing Act. And um, I mean it was without blinking and it was strong and powerful and so we are taking major steps and I think we can get the motion up here that was passed by our executive committee. Yeah, here you go. So um, the executive committee authorized expenditures of up to $100,000 uh, to try and achieve two major goals. One is to promote realtor awareness of and compliance with fair housing laws in Washington State. The other is to promote awareness of the value of home ownership, including as a means of building generational wealth throughout all demographic uh, sections of Washington and geographic sections of Washington. And then in the rationale, there's different ways that we might go about trying to achieve that. And that includes uh, revamping the fair housing training to include uh, sections on you know, uh, unconscious bias. Because we, we all, come on man, we all grew up with some biases and you, you know, we, we need to understand how to uh, recognize that and accept that and move forward. Uh, so things like that. Uh, how do we incentivize our brokers and companies and local associations to really build a culture of commitment to fair housing? <coughs> how do we make it real? 
how do we make a real city, not just sitting there, you know, I'm checking the boxes because I don't want to get in trouble with the government, but really understanding the impact that we, as an organization, as an industry, can have on people's lives. So really, this matters, it really does. So, um, uh, and what we also are putting together, uh, we have commitments from an advisory group, uh, including the State Human Rights Commission, uh, HUD, uh, and a couple of fair housing uh, organizations, nonprofits that are gonna work with us to make sure we're doing things right, make sure we're not duplicating uh, efforts. Uh, our advisory group will also include uh, realtor members, and uh, our leadership is in the process of identifying who they're gonna be, and we'll be making those appointments very soon. But uh, President Kitty has uh, given me the okay to announce that the chair of that uh, advisory group will be our past president, Jerry Martin. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, uh, and here's the other good, good news, is that NAR is also taking very significant and major steps to uh, vindicate the principles of the Fair Housing Act and the Fair Housing Laws. And so uh, they announced their uh, action plan, and when you look at it, it's almost a mirror image of ours with a couple of additional things. And uh, because between our volunteers and our staff, we have such great relationships with NER, we reached out to them and talked to the, you know, the top staff people that are working on this, and we are uh, gonna try and be partnering with NAR, kind of be in the uh, beta test state, how do we make this thing really happen? Uh, on this at the street level, so it's not just something that's drilling out from Washington DC or Olympia, Washington So we're really looking forward to all of that. So um, let me let me finish up with this um, This is an opportunity for us to really uh, act you know, as an organization and The reason why I'm taking a fair amount of time to talk about this is that this is a huge priority now for Washington Realtors and it will be on an ongoing basis, because I told you it, it went from Dale to Kitty to Tom to Rich. This is gonna be, this isn't going away, right? Your association is absolutely committed to this, so that's great. Um, you know, I've had the opportunity, and, and some of it uh, arising from com conversations with some of you in the room to really kind of think about my own story and how this all fits in. And this gives us an opportunity to think about us and how we fit into the American dream and what we can be thankful for and what we know our colleagues uh, have had to try and overcome on a very personal and individual basis. So, uh, you know, I started off with a bunch of bummers and, uh, you know, a, a historical bummer. And I always like to end on a high note because you may remember last year my speech was all about optimism and I do believe that, uh, I, I do consider myself an optimist and I do believe that we can do good things and keep moving forward and you know, always be striving and aspire to what our founding documents describe our country to be. I totally believe that. Um, and so, uh, you know, my, one of my favorite quotes is a quote about optimism, and I'd love to share and leave you with this. Um, Real optimism is aware of problems, but recognizes the solutions. Knows about difficulties, but believes they can be overcome. Sees the negatives, but accentuates the positives, is exposed to the worst, but expects the best, has reason to complain, but chooses to smile. Mm. And I think if we have that attitude, both with fair housing, when you go up on the hill, everything we do, uh, uh, we'll just continue being stronger and, um, and just doing great things for our members and for our clients.